Well, hello, it's Nico from Horticulture, and today we are in my home studio. I got Pro Tools up. I got the session for Within Without ready to go, and I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a tour of the musical inspiration of the song. Let's check it out. So, got Pro Tools up over here, and as I said, so this is the session for Within Without. This is actually the demo session that I made. So this is not the one that's all fancy that has um, all of Eric's awesome uh, sound design and production and layering and all that stuff. This is just the session that I made when I was fleshing out what the arrangement and layers of the song might be. So you'll see some, uh, uh, some differences. You'll hear some differences for sure. Sometimes uh, certain songs I write actually have a purpose. Um, more than just like, I want to make a neat song. I want it to go boop, beep, boop. <laughs> All songs have that purpose, of course, naturally. Um, but in this case, uh, this one actually had a very specific role that I was trying to accomplish. So I have a couple different ways I can think about what the purpose of a song might be or what the role of a song might be. Um, for us, since our goal is to write dark electronic club music that is played, oh, in the goth industrial clubs. Um, that's one perspective I often will think of is, what would the DJ want? What are the different tempos, styles, feels, energy levels uh, that would go well within um, any set that someone in that particular environment is trying to play? Eventually, I want to have a song in our repertoire that fits any style within that goth industrial scene. Uh, so that's one way to think like, okay, what are we missing? What are we, what's a common tempo or style that DJs want to mix into? And I want to have a song that fits that. And then the other one for us is live performance. So thinking about how to construct a live set. And again, if you are planning a set from beginning to end, a sort of a roller coaster flow of ups and downs and pacing and where does it go? And what are the, you know, you, you want to show off some diversity and all that stuff. And I go, okay, so what do we need to start off our live set? And in this case, this was one of those things that was built, again, purpose-built, to create um, our intro. So this was all entirely built on the idea of having a really strong introduction song for our live set. And in the past, I've learned a lot about kind of what works and what doesn't work for a introduction song for a live show. A lot of times um, in bands, it's very tempting to want to just like, you know, go all uh, guns ablazing right away. You count off with stick. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it doesn't really, uh, I don't think is the best way to start it off. And I, I've found that building suspense, capturing the interest of the audience is extremely important. So taking them somewhere, starting off with something like, hmm, where's this going to go? Uh, because basically with any live show, you are fighting <laughs> you are fighting everyone else's interest to do everything else but watch you. So you got people at the bar, they want to drink. You got people on their phones just doing whatever. They might be texting or playing a game. People that want to have a conversation, you know, out in the corner or outside. You know, even though they're at a bar with live music, they don't necessarily want to watch you unless they're there for you. But even then, sometimes you have friends and they'll still be talking. But your goal is to win them over. So to me, the idea that something starts kind of more mysterious and you're kind of you know you're kind of like okay where you're going with this is enough to sometimes get people's attention make them stop and go oh what's going on because if you just start you know rocking start rocking right away first of, all, first of all there's nowhere to go from there and second of all it becomes that sort of um sort of threshold white noise after a while they're just like yep well they're just rocking out that's what it is but you want to give them some suspense you want to figure out a way to make them interested in where you're going to be taking them. And so again, that was my intention of designing this song. So you can see how the theme and we talked about last time in the lyrics, this whole thing about this storm coming at you and gradually building and building and building is also what's happening in the music, right? So the whole thing is all based off this, this little um, arpeggio or ostinato, and which is this, which you've heard. Anyway, so this whole thing was built around this ostinato, this arpeggio. Uh, ostinato, by the way, is just a, p a repeated melodic phrase. So that's this guy right here. And you can see I got two, two different layers here. 
Um, so I call them poly and poly2. And um, so this whole thing was kind of built on, I think, something I was just humming in my head. There's that I was like kind of just pacing around as I do pace a lot and um, I was like hmm that's pretty cool maybe I should record it see where it goes it could be nothing it could be something and that's where I came up with that so found this little it's the preset in Omnisphere which is a synth by the way um, it's got different sounds so it's just a one called Dancing Plux. You got Omnisphere, you can go look it up. There it is. Um, nothing nothing fancy there. Um, but yeah. It was just... Uh, so, uh, just that basic little thing. So program that in, which is what you see down here. All these uh, crazy little dots. Those are all little MIDI notes there. So... And you can see this little line underneath it. That's the automation, which is basically as the um, song goes on, where I'm basically opening up the sound, which is uh, something called cutoff. You're opening that up, and I just sort of automated that with the mod wheel over here, which you can't see, but it's on the keyboard. Um, but I can draw in that automation. Again, if you are a musician, this is obvious to you. You're like, duh. But for those of you who are not, this allows me to slowly open up or change the sound. So you can see over here, it's kind of more closed. It's a little, little more brighter here, more pluckier. By the time I get over here, much brighter versus, you know, that kind of thing. So that changes over time. And what's, what's interesting, I think, about this idea was, or this song is, is just like an experiment to see how can I take this ostinato, this repeating melodic phrase, and keep it so the song, the entire song is built off of that. So there are no separate chord patterns or sections in this song that are not based on this exact same phrase. Everything is built on this. So rather than having an entirely different chord pattern for say a verse and a chorus or a bridge or a pre-chorus or whatever instrumental section, it's all based on that And so it presents musically, it's kind of fun because you go, okay, if I just do this the entire song, it's gonna get really fucking boring, right? If it doesn't go anywhere, if it doesn't build or add any new layers or develop. So it was a fun challenge uh, from an arrangement point of view to go, okay, how can I make totally different sections in the song, an actual chorus, a verse, and an instrumental section, all based upon um, the same thing. How can I make it feel different? How can I add changes? And of course, that whether or not I succeeded, that's entirely up to you. Um, I think it works. You may disagree. That's okay. But it's a fun little idea. Like, how can you do that? So we have different layers. So the, the ne very next thing I'm gonna have after I got this in there, program this, and I'm like, cool, I like this. Is you know, usually I wanna have some sort of rhythm to play against to develop the rest of the layers in the song. So we're gonna go over to drums, and in this case, um, I got something called battery, um, which is from Native Instruments. And I usually just quickly pick a um, kit and something that works for me. I've been, lately you can see all these things that's got my name in it. I've been building up all of my own uh, libraries of sounds lately, which I just started to do. So I have kind of a go-to of all of my favorite um, kicks and uh, snares and hats. And so I'm not limited to the preset kits that um, you know uh, Native Instruments has made. But if we go over here, so each one of these little things in a grid is a scent. Jesus Christ, that's an annoying sound. Um, each one of these is a different sample. So there's a snare, there's a snare, there's some different kicks, etc. And then you can program, program all these things up here. Um, you can see all the, the notes down here. This is the kick drum. So, so when this comes in over here, right here, and over here, we got an up little hi-hat guy. Guy, happy little hi-hat. So anyway, that was the first thing was, you know, I knew this was gonna be a four on the floor because that type of a just seems four on the floor to me. I mean, I guess you could turn it into a groove-based sort of beat, 
I don't know. It doesn't, I don't think it has the same feel I was going for. So, so it was four on the floor. So I just, usually I'll just programming something really quickly. So remember, this is my demo session. This is not the final session that you're hearing with all the, the, because I think we changed the drums on it. We changed, we added a bunch of layers and a bunch of other stuff into it too, and changed the sounds and definitely vocals are different. They're actually good-ish. They're good-ish. I wouldn't say they're good, but they're better than this one. Uh, so then I have that, so now we have both this layer and that layer. And I forgot to say there's two layers here. I forgot to show you that, by the way. So there's another one here. Let me get rid of that. Um, so I have I had a second layer, which is a synth um, called Serum. So I'll just program this little thing with these kind of weird square slash pulsy sort of pulse width sort of waves here. And this sounds like this. It might be hard to hear on your phone. Sounds like this. So the point is, it adds a little bit more thickness and texture behind the main, sort of the hero synth, which is this. Right? That really bright attack, high attack sort of sound. If you take it out, you notice it. You're like, it doesn't feel as thick anymore. It just kind of, again, thickens the sound up. I, I'll, I'll do that a lot where I'll kind of layer couple different types of sounds together for for one thing something has more of the attack sound that I want something has more of the mid-rangey thicker sound or something has more of a distorted sound and I mix the the non-distorted or the plucky one with the more legato sound and I don't know it tends to it tends to fill in all the blanks of the sound that's missing but usually the next thing I'll go is um especially here if I got that I got I went to bass so this is another one um, another Omnisphere sound. It's got that really kind of ow, 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 ow. So the reason we, so we got this on the upbeats, which is very important in when you're trying to make dance music. To me, I always think of it as uh, very physical. So I think of it as um, how does the music make me move in my body physically? Because I do like to dance, I like to go to the clubs. And so to me, everything is kinetic. And if I'm listening to a song idea and I'm not doing this subconsciously without realizing it, that's a bad sign. If I'm just going, well, obviously sneering isn't good. But if I'm just doing this, that's a, me, uh, that's a sign for me that I am not writing something that I would even want to dance to. And it's supposed to be dance music. You knew that. So one great way, if you think of music kinetically in, in the body, one great way to get people to physically move is you're looking at stuff that tends to be on the upbeats and things that are polyrhythmic which is usually any sort of rhythm that goes against your downbeat. It could be a repeated pattern, it could be a more complex pattern that's less repeated. Um, but you're looking at something that um, goes against your downbeat. Your downbeat is gonna be that four on the floor kick drum. Doom, doom, doom. Um, so in this case, we have the bass hitting the upbeats, which is the beats, of course, in between each uh, kick drum, which is very, very common. I'm not saying this because it's a revolutionary thing to do. It's really, really common uh, in dance music. And the reason you can hit that uh, as opposed to combining the kick drum and the bass, you can do that too. There's nothing wrong with that. But we're trying to get a particular feel. And generally, you get the kick drum coming downward, which actually makes your body do this subconsciously. Watch yourself next time you're like dancing to music. You come down, your body wants to come down a little bit on that kick drum, and then you want to give your body something to lift back up so you create a natural bounce in the body kinetically. And having the bass on the upbeats See? I mean, you're seeing me doing it, but if that was just on the downbeat, if it was just if it was kick and um, bass together, you can do that. That's there's nothing wrong with that. It just creates a very different feel. It, it's going to feel more plodding, just boo 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 together. Um, and there are certain styles of music and certain styles, even within um, the goth industrial scene, there are certain styles that you can, if it's slower and more aggressive, there are sometimes if you want a really heavy downbeat, which almost gives you more of a headbang feel like more of a metal rock sort of thing rather than a dance where you feel like you want to lift up. 
with your body, you want to actually kind of slam it like this. Down, 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 down. There's sometimes where that can, you know, but it's, it's about the feel of the song. This one, I wanted it to move and groove more. Yes, move and groove more. Um, and then we have a second layer, which I added in there, um, which this guy. So it's, a, it's another bass. It's a plucky bass, uh, very short attack, and it's something that adds a little more rhythm. And it's, it's not, um, it's kind of subtle. It's not super in your face, but it adds just a little bit more of rhythmic variety, which, you know, makes it feel more interesting. So anyway, so this song, as you, as you already know, builds up. We got a bunch of other layers. We got sweeps, which sound like this. To kind of, and to me, that's like a very assemblage 23 um, style of sound. Like I wanted it to sound very much like that. A big filter sweep, uh, laser, laser synth sound to start the chorus. We got that guy in there. So a lot, again, a lot of this is just stuff I put together in demo. We got pads at the very end. So um, another serum over here. So I made a little pad out of some of these waveforms here. Sounds like Strange Love, doesn't it? Doom, 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 doom. Strange Love. What fucking key am I in? So, and we got this guy here. And that's another serum patch, which is really cool. I really, I love this sound. Um, I don't know if I made this one. I don't think I did. This might have been a preset that I fucked with, but um, probably because it's really cool. <laughs> Therefore, it couldn't have been me. Um, I'm not a great sound designer. I've gotten better, uh, I, but I tend to kind of just go with presets. But anyway, so there's that. I think that's a really cool sound. It has kind of a bit crush thing, so it feels really like old and lo-fi. A lot of delay on there. I tend to throw lots of delay on shit. And then lastly, we have the vocals. I'll show you a little bit of some demo vocals. Actually, you know what we'll do? You know what we're gonna do? I'm gonna show you the really old scratch track vocals before I wrote lyrics and before I settled on a melody. You wanna hear that? Sure you do. Sure you do. So, when I was first fleshing this out, um, I'll just start singing nonsense words and uh, just to get a melody, try to test melodies and stuff and then I, so I can record it, hear it back, see how it feels and go, mm, do I like that? Do I like, do I not like that? And to do that, I won't just go la 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 la. I'll actually sing random words that come to me. So sometimes they make sense, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're just plain silly. Um, but sometimes they end up being actual lyric lines that I randomly like, or at least words I go, that's cool, I'll save that for the lyrics. So here's what this sounds like. I'm gonna show you this. So here's my old demo vocal before I found the right melody and before I had the lyrics. You ready? This will probably be embarrassing. I never wanted anything. That's different. I never wanted what you always try to be. Very different melody. And again, nonsense words. It's all right. Um, obviously, it was enough for me to try to record it, so I didn't hate it at the time. Um, but let's see if I did. I get the chorus too. Oh, it's the same thing. I just copied it and boosted the gain. It's still there. So, you can see that even before I wrote lyrics, I had this line that I liked. I didn't even, again, I hadn't technically written lyrics yet, but here's that line, we can't live within, and it's the right melody too. Well, right. I guess it's to say it's the melody that I sang that I ended up keeping. There's not really a right or wrong melody when it comes to making music. There's what do you like more, what fits the song, what fits your intention, but you can see that sometimes things that are kind of completely spontaneous and in the moment, which was coming up with that you know, melody and that line, we can't, we can't live within, we can't live without, stayed. 
because I liked it. I'm like, that feels right. That felt right to me. And so I kept it. Of course, the verse changed. So I'll show you scratch track verse, again, before lyrics, but now I had the, I was working on a different melody, so. Come take my passion now and leave me with my scars. You only take what you can't borrow. Same melody, just random words. Come take my everything and show me who's to blame. Blame? You are to blame, you are to blame. So, you can see, still pre-lyrics, I had already come up with some words like, spontaneously just that sounded good to sing and felt like they kind of matched the song. It was, again, just to get the melody in there, just to record it and hear it back. But you can see there are a lot of words I use, like in the blame and, and things about scars um, that ended up in there in some way, shape, or form. Uh, this version, you, you can see that it's more accusatory there. You are to blame. Because I didn't have a premise yet, right? I didn't know the specifics of what I was saying. I just knew when, when certain words feel right lyrically to the music, feel like they match the music, you go, yeah, those words feel right and they feel good to sing. I make note of that and often they'll end up in some configuration in the lyrics because I feel so much of it, so much, yeah, so much of it is feel. So much of it is just kind of like, does it feel right? Does it not feel right? Um, and I can extract more literal meaning from it later. But usually it's about singability and whether or not the words feel emotionally correct to what the song is trying to do. So there you go. There's some of that. Old, old vocals. And then finally did the lyrics just for test. We brace for impact as we're waiting for the storm. Which is, that's not the final vocal, that's just my demo version to hear the lyrics back. Because after I've been sitting with nonsense lyrics for a while, I start getting used to those. So I have to kind of record, not even kind of, I actually record the, the lyrics once I finish them so I can hear them back. But this is not the final performance. I, I go to Eric's, he's got better equipment, better microphones, a whole better like um, recording chain so it's cleaner signal. So we do everything over there. Plus it's nice to have someone else there to go, no, that sucks, do it again. No, I need another one because you didn't do it. Um, otherwise I'll be too easy on myself if it's just in my own studio. I'm like, oh, it's fine, it's good enough, whatever. So yeah, uh, there's a little tour through not every tiny detail, but there's kind of some of the music and some of the uh, amazing tales behind it. So there you go. Um, hopefully next we can go to Eric's studio and have him actually show you more details in the mix itself and how he made it sound, I think, as awesome as he did. So thanks for joining me. Hopefully this was somewhat interesting for you. And if not, you watched it anyway. <laughs> but good. I'm glad you uh, spent time with me. I like talking about this stuff. And hopefully you like listening to it. There's a lot of hopefully in this, isn't it? Very optimistic. Hopefully this. Anyway, thanks for joining me. And I will see you next time.